Good afternoon, everyone. Um, how are you all doing today? Okay, good. I hope you had a good lunch, but not a very good lunch. Right? <laughs> I'm hoping you, you kind of stay awake during this and uh, you know can interact and uh, get to know the nice, nice, lively session. Also, I'm hoping nobody's hiding in eggs or tomatoes or you know, those kinds of things. But I have a place to hide if you do. Um, all right. So, uh, brief intro. My name is Sesh or Sushadri. Um, I work for a company called IHS. I'm a principal project manager, um, responsible for agile transformation across uh, the company. Uh, part of what I do is help some of the forecasting, budgeting, and planning uh, for the training sessions we do as part of our conferences. Uh, I have a colleague here, Sean Dunn, some other colleagues also, um, and uh, Scott Weatherby also right now is working here. And he's got some sessions going on as well. Um, so there are two reasons why I'm here in, um, in Bangalore. First one, obviously, is for this session. The second reason is um, we are helping our India team transform at this point. Uh, we are starting the planning the seeds of transformation in our India uh, office here. So in the next couple of weeks, after this week, uh, Sean and I will be um, doing that, you know, training our teams in Agile, uh, Scrum Master Group guys, and, and some sessions like that. So the two things I want to talk about mainly, the first one is culture. The second thing is the impact of culture on Agile transformation. What do we mean by culture, and how does it impact whatever you're trying to do across your, your organization? So let's read some common understanding of, of the definition of what we are trying to discuss. Uh, let's look at what transformation actually means. So transformation is a slow or dramatic change in form or appearance. And what is culture? Culture is the attitudes and behavior characteristic of a particular social group. Now, what constitutes a social group, right? So there are teams of developers. Are they a social group? Um, the organization level, is the organization a social group? And is Bengaluru, uh, are the inhabitants, residents of Bengaluru a social group? And are inhabitants of India a social group? Um, based on, the, on, the, on what it says, it seems like it is. If you look at uh, your team level, maybe all your developers are exhibiting a certain characteristic, a certain um, way of doing things. That makes them part of a developer culture. And the same is true of your organization. Uh, transcending your team level, maybe your organization has certain values and principles they want to inculcate in you. That will constitute some kind of a culture as well at the organization level. Um, you know, Bangalore is, is a great place. I was here a couple of years ago on, on vacation with my family, and it was a really nice time. Um, this is a happening city. This is a, uh, a vibrant, uh, young, youthful, restful, uh, energetic city, except for the traffic. Right? <laughs> Other than that, it's, it's fantastic. Um, so my hope is that my current stay continues to be at the same level of fun, the same level of enjoyment that I had last time, even though it was vacation, which is all work. Um, there are definitions, and then there is reality, right? So there is form and appearance that we produce. There are things that are superficial, and then there are things that are internal, such as behaviors and attitudes and culture. These are all internal things. These are things we hold within ourselves. These are things that are characteristic of certain people, certain type, certain group. Um, when we talk about agile transformation, we are talking about changing certain things. Okay, what are we talking about? Um, if you look at the overall hierarchy, there is the team level. We talked about the organization level, uh, city or state level, which we just mentioned, and then the country. Um, each of these um, levels have certain cultural attributes to them. What we do through each of these levels is context dependent. Let me give an example. Um, let's say that you know your team has a culture that Friday evening we will go out and go to the local pub and, and have fun, right? Now as they're doing that, say a friend comes by and says, um, "Hey, you know, uh, Sesh, I have a uh, my grandfather celebrating his 90th birthday. Right? Would you want to come by and, and celebrate with us next week?" And you're like, "Sure, absolutely. You know, it's a friend. You know, it's an obligation to some extent, but also you are part of this different social group there, like someone's friend. So yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you'll do that." What he just did is he switched context, right? He went from being a, around a team level culture, you just transcended that level, you went to a different level. And then after the conversation, you jump back to the team level again. So you're changing context without realizing you're doing that. And that's because we have these things internalized. We are absorbed in a culture, and the culture is absorbed in us. And that, that, that is the reason why it is difficult to change these things. It is difficult to adjust these things because they're not some external thing, you know, if your hair is gray, put some dye on it, you know. But these are internal things. This is hard to change. Uh, when you change these contexts, this is very highly frequent. And 
it's a talk to another. You do this all the time. You just don't realize it. You know, when you have an email come from your father, it gets more immediate attention sometimes than an email from your boss, right? Uh, it's something important. You want to take the, take the phone call and do that. Uh, at that point, your life becomes more important than your work. So this context still happens, and we don't realize it. This transition is seamless, believe it or not. You know, if you think deliberately about this, if you think very consciously, intentionally about this, you are doing it right now. <laughs> you know, you are thinking, when the heck is the guy going to stop, and when can I go back home or something, right? Go back to my coffee break or lunch break. So that's a different level of transition you're making. But you're doing that consciously. So, but unlike technical context you're making, where you know you're programming, your boss comes and says, "Hey, fix this problem," or your product owner comes and says, "Hey, fix that problem." There, it's a tiresome context you're making. That is a draining context you're making. This is a rewarding context you're making. This actually is a useful context you're making because it defines you as a person. It defines you as part of a social group. That's the critical difference between context seeking at the cultural level versus context seeking at the work level. Now, this can also prove tiresome if, for example, your um, wife or your husband nags you on a constant basis when you're at work. <laughs> so, or your son calls you up all the time on your cell phone and says, Dad, you have this problem. I want to do this homework. And your boss is saying, well, I want to get this done. In that situation, this can be tiresome. But usually, it's not. Um, that was the example we talked about, the bowling alley or your bar with your, your friends, with your family. right? So we talk about culture just now. We kind of have an understanding of what it generally means. But what makes for successful culture, right? What is, what is something that defines a successful culture? Um, if you look at the first important thing about a culture that is important, it basically it's just helps it survive and it's adaptation. Anything that doesn't adapt will become irrelevant very quickly. So the first tool is to adapt. The second is to evolve. When you, you're not just adapting. When you're adapting, you're also evolving to some extent. Um, so the example can be something like this. We wouldn't have giraffes, for example, if there was not some kind of a, uh, animal with a long, leg, a long neck, which was able to reach some tree and some leaf, and that was a genetic mutation that got passed down because it was able to survive, while the short-necked animals couldn't survive. So over time, um, you know, we have giraffes which have all long necks, for example. That's one of the you know, basic examples of, of how evolution works. The other thing that successful cultures must do is contribute. You can't just adapt and evolve. You can't be all the time consuming things. Right? You can't be just receiving. You have to be able to generate something. You have to be able to create something and provide something. Right? So culture must be able to contribute. Without contribution, a culture becomes a selfish culture. And usually, those kind of cultures quickly get put out of business if, you, if you're not careful. Um, so we talk about culture. Let's look at culture of you know, India, for example. Now, India has been an interesting culture. It's, it's more than 5,000 years old. At different points in her history, India was ruled by the British or, or, the, or the Mughals. In some parts of India ruled by the French or the Portuguese, right? You have different influences there. Now, how did India handle that? That's an important uh, thing to realize that 5,000 years down the line, it's still surviving and thriving, and we are prime examples of that here. Um, there are influences in music, drama, literature, architecture, philosophy, and, and the sciences. If you go down to Bombay, um, you will see some of those very beautiful buildings uh, that were built by the British. If you go down to South India, um, you see some of the temples. The architecture uh, is just amazing. It's, it's completely different. You go down to Goa and you see some Portuguese influences, for example. Uh, you go to you know, Gujarat or go to Delhi, you'll see Mughal influences, especially in, in Delhi, the Kutub Minar and Taj uh, Mahal in Agra. So these are all influences of foreign cultures. Now, what did that do? Did it change who we are? No. What it did is it helped us evolve, helped our culture adapt. Now, for those of you into food, I'm guessing most of you <laughs> are into food at, to some level, um, there's this concept of Indo Chinese food, right? There is Indian food. There is Chinese food, and then there's Indo-Chinese food. So what is Indo-Chinese food? I mean, you, you, you're probably serving it here right now. So is it you take some um, noodle dish, you add some garam masala to it, and that's Indo-Chinese? <laughs> probably not. To some extent, it's probably true. But it's a fusion dish. So what is fusion other than adaptation and evolution? Right? If you're into music, um, there's something called jazz fusion. Right? What is jazz fusion? Well, you, you know, the, uh, there are artists like El Subramaniam and people like that who are, who are worldwide exponents of this kind of music. So this, again, shows you that these are very, very beautiful things that happen when cultures evolve and adapt and contribute. That's the most important thing you can take away from this. And you see curry houses in, in, um, in London, for example, are a big business. So while India has contributed uh, different things to these, <laughs> while the, the biggest contribution, I would say, to London is curry houses. Uh, they're extremely popular. They're all over the place. 
and some of the soft notch ones are, are very, very, very nice, very expensive, and, and they're wonderful food. Um, so that's an influence that India has had on, on London, for example, on London food scene, for example. Um, so we're talking about cultures, how cultures transcend uh, our individual level, as opposed to the teams, the organizations, the families, the country, and all of those things. Now, we also are talking about agile transformation. That's the second thing we're talking about. So what is the need for agile transformation? Why should we bother? It's part of the evolution adaptation message, of course, but why should we actually do that? First of all, there's competition in the market. You need to be able to get to your customers faster than other people can. So the time to market factor is there. You need to have faster delivery cycles and you should be able to deliver more complex, more rich features to your customers. Then there is stronger quality. You want better quality in what you deliver. You can't just deliver junk products, right? I mean, they will take one look at it. Maybe they can fool them once. Second time, they're going to buy your stuff. You're out of business. Then you need customer focus. You need to talk to your customers all the time. If you don't talk to your customers who are paying your bills and helping you feed your family, what is the point of doing business, right? Predictable delivery is important too. Um, it's where you promise your customer. You sign a contract with your customer. Hey, in six months, I'm going to do this for you. If you don't do it, your credibility is shot. Where are you then? If you next time you promise something, nobody's going to listen to you, right? This happens in all spheres of life. Uh, if, you, if you promise your wife something or your husband something and you don't do it, don't follow through, next time it's going to be a little bit more difficult to trust you. This is important to have predictable delivery. And more than anything else, right, more, at, uh, more than anything else is higher productivity and happiness is crucial. If you don't have this, um, the productivity and happiness, uh, all of the above, it's going to be pointless to do all of that. Because people are producing this. Human beings are producing this, not some chemical machines. Although maybe uh, a couple of hundred years from now, machines may be doing the job, right? We may be out of shop completely. Who knows? But for now, we are employed, and we are happy to be employed, and we continue to do this. So now here is the last point. I brought it down last because I wanted to emphasize that this is a total cultural and behavior attitude mindset change. Now what does it emphasize? It emphasizes ownership, commitment, responsibility, and transparency. These are four elements that are absolutely important um, to have in your organization, to drive in your organization. Without these four, there are other factors too, obviously, and we will see some of those. But these factors are critical to ensuring that your employees are engaged with you. They are on par with you. They're walking the same steps that you are. And your organization is delivering what you're promising because your employees are delivering what they are promising that they, that they will. Okay. But what are we really transforming? We, when we talk about agile transformation, we are saying, hey, let's implement Scrum. Let's implement Kanban or Equity or, or whatever you know, flavor that you want to implement. What are we really transforming? We are looking at, let's look at some superficial factors, right? So methodology, that's, that's something. Uh, processes. A lot of very uh, favorite words for a lot of different people, practices, tools. These things are actually superficial. Do you, do you agree? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Um, when you implement something like a tool um, and you're saying this is what the entire organization will use, how relevant is that going to be in a, in a couple of years or three or four years down the line when something much better comes along at a far cheaper price? So does your transformation account for that or does your transformation Require that you have this tool throughout the lifetime of your company? That makes no sense. Why do we sign yearly contracts with our vendors, right? There's a reason we sign yearly contracts with our vendors because we know that at some point, they are going to become irrelevant. So you are hedging your bets, right? You're hedging your bet against that. You're making sure that if something better comes along, I want to jump ship. Same reason why when you rent an apartment, you don't sign a lifetime deal with them, right? You sign a maybe a one year, two year deal with your apartment complex and you go along. If something better comes along, you switch. These are superficial factors. They are enablers, in my opinion, to some extent. But are they valuable? Are they delivering true value to you? Probably are. But what are we really transforming? What should we be really transforming? The human factors. These are the things that are important. Let's see what they are. First of all, behavior, right? If you want to transform the behavior. By behavior, I'm, I don't mean uh, something like if a person um, has some anger issues or something like that, and that's a personal thing. That might be important to transform because if they in collaboration with the teams, it's affected as a result of that. You want, you want to be careful about that. But I'm not talking about personal type of behavior. You see what, what, what I mean now. You changing attitudes. Attitude means a deference and dedication towards quality, for example, is an attitude. A lot of um, technical people may have this attitude that as long as it's just good enough, I'm going to ship it. Or I'm going to just check it in. A uh, couple of unit tests have failed, corner, corner case scenarios. Not everybody is seeing, going to see these problems. Why do we bother, right? Let's just, uh, let's just ship it anyway, it doesn't matter. Now, the product owner says, these are critical, you'll fix them. 
but even if he says that, maybe there's a counter argue. Ah, you know, this is a counter case. We really want to fix this. This is how much time it's going to take. Culture. Oh, this one is going to recur a few times, and you get sick and tired of it. Um, culture. This is the most important thing. It affects every single other thing. Culture subsumes and consumes everything else, and you'll see why. Beliefs. What, what are the beliefs that somebody has? And why should we look at beliefs as a critical part of human factor or human identity? The human identity is enormously complex. There are so many things that are racing through our minds right now. For example, you may have already formed an opinion of me. You may be thinking this guy is not effective at what he's doing. Some of you may be thinking, yeah, it's pretty okay. Some of you, yeah, he, he's decent. Uh, some of you may think it's pretty good. So you, you've already formed opinion. You already have your belief system at this point telling you what to make of me from either a biased point of view or a prejudiced point of view or from the point of view that of prior experience. Maybe somebody looked like me in the past and hurt you <laughs> or something. This guy is, so you carry these kinds of beliefs inside. You carry these kinds of prejudices and biases inside. And we've got to look at that also. And these will affect how you work in the office. You're not a different human being when you're at home than when you're at your office. You're the same person to some extent. You put on a mask maybe, right? You put on some kind of a curtain in front of you which shows a different person outside. When you get home, you're totally different. Isn't it? So, for example, uh, you know, a high court judge uh, or, or a big policeman or the chief of police, you know, you wear a big uniform in the office, you've got a lot of respect and authority, the way he walks, the way he talks. People are afraid of him to some extent. They're fearful. He gets home, you know, he's on his hands and knees and his kid is riding his back. You know, his kid is on his back and maybe slapping him or something. Even case pulling his hair. Does he care? No. It's the same person. He puts on a different identity when he's in the office than when he's at home. So these are also internal things. These are internal things that we try to mask by wearing some other thing on top of it. And that is why these are incredibly difficult to change, incredibly difficult to transform. So while these four in the front, um, the superficial factors are there, they are important. What's way more important are the, are the things at the bottom. Do people agree, gentlemen? Okay, thank you. Um, what do transformations bring up? They bring up hidden biases. Let me give you an example. I was giving this example a couple of days ago. I'm going to speak it because some people may get bored here because I've heard this before. But let's say you go on vacation and, um, and you forgot to um, drain your swimming pool. Okay. Um, you come back from vacation a month later or something, and you notice something is murky on top. You've got some leaves and bedding that hopefully no dead animals. Um, then you try to clean the surface. You look down. It's still murky. You know, it seems kind of dirty. So you, you bring your uh, cleaning device, whatever that is, start cleaning your swimming pool. When you start doing that, you know, the water gets dirtier. Does this mean the water was dirty always, or does it mean the water is dirty now? Okay. So things get clouded, the water gets cloudy, and more and more dirty. What, what is it really doing? It's actually cleaning the system, right? It's coming out because the cleaning process removes those things. It gets rid of those things, and those things have nowhere to go but float out or, or hang around somewhere till they are pulled away. Why am I giving this example? Because Agile does exactly that. Agile will do this. It will shine a light on every single corner of the home where you don't clean easily and your wife keeps nagging you to clean those old cobwebs that have been around for five, ten years and you never bother to clean it. It shines light on those dark corners where you've completely forgotten about um, the bad processes, the bad behaviors, the bad attitudes that have been dwelling for a long, long, long time till they have become institutionalized. At this point, it's in the memory of your organization's organism. Your organization is an organism because we are organisms. Take us away, the company is nothing but a shell, it's going to collapse, right? Whatever we are, our company becomes that. That's why transformations, just like they bring up all the muck and the dirt out of the system, our transformations will bring up hidden biases. What, what are they? This is a very brief list. If you look at um, books by Dan Ariely and, and, and um, you know, um, Cass Sunstein, Alicia Thaler, you, you will read a lot of interesting information about what makes us what we are and what kind of biases we carry inside. We talked about cultures, beliefs, internal systems. Now look at these, right? You have technological bias, which means so I may consider uh, Visual Studio the, the best thing there is in the entire world. I will never consider Eclipse, Eclipse, for example, even though in some ways Eclipse may be better, right? I carry the technological bias. Uh, process and procedures. You may believe that this is the way things ought to be done, and if it's different, I'm not going to listen to it because this is work for me, and why should I bother to change, right? That's your bias right there, methodology bias. Some people are married to Scrum uh, or to Agile or Kanban, whatever it might be. And they will refuse to consider anything else. Um, Sean gave a talk uh, this morning, a 
about, about transformation leadership, one of the things you mentioned was if you come back 10 years later, right, and see your organization, can you recognize what your organization looks like? Will you be able to identify what your organization looks like? If you cannot, that's probably a good thing because things have changed. So why should we have a bias about a certain methodology? You should be able to say, for now it's working, right? Two years down the line, it may not. So let's change. Group think is another dangerous idea where a bunch of people get together and, and they follow this herd mentality. One person says yes, other people feel pressured. They feel it's really difficult to say no and they go with it. There are very um, interesting social experiments done on these kind of topics and, and uh, it, some of them are, are pretty disturbing because they, they are scary. Um, status quo is another famous thing. Um, you don't want to change, you know, this is working for us and this is great. Change requires a lot of disruption, a lot of angst, a lot of annoyance. Why should we bother with these kinds of things? And availability bias, anything that um, is available to you, most recently in your memory is, is the MRU, right? Most recently used or most, uh, those kinds of things pop up top of your head. There is proximity bias. Anything you are closest to, you will always consider to be the most important thing. That, that will affect how you look at things, okay? So anchoring is another important part. When you do user story uh, estimation, now anchoring, the, I want to take a couple of seconds and give you a story about this interesting thing. Uh, there was an experiment done where the goal was, tell me the population of a certain country, right? Just give me the population of a certain country. Before that experiment was done, um, as a side test, the real test is not the population of the country, right? The, the real test is this. The participants were asked to give their social security numbers. You know, if you're not familiar, uh, in the US, there is a nine digit number that, that is like your PAN ID, for example, in India, right? So people are asked to write down those numbers. Some people are asked to write, and some people are not asked to write down that number. Interesting thing is, everybody who wrote down their social security number gave the population of that country as a much higher number, even though that number has nothing to do with the population of the country. Why? Because they got anchored in that value. That's called anchoring bias. Same thing happens when you do shopping, right? They'll say $75 off and $70% off, off of that. You're looking at that number, maybe $200 worth of something, and they're saying 75% off. Oh, this is great. This is a great deal. You know, I saved so much money. You're anchored at the 200 level when the worth is probably 50 bucks, and you're still paying 50 bucks, right? So that is anchoring. These kinds of things affect us on a daily basis. We don't realize that they are. And I strongly encourage you that go research some of these, and you'll be shocked at how you're being manipulated on a daily basis. User story estimation quickly can fall into this kind of a trap, where people start thinking 50 points, everything is 50 points, everything is 70 points, right? That kind of things can happen. So what do biases lead to? When you have some kind of bias, it can lead to resistance because bias is all about resisting change. So what, what are the types of resistance you, you may come across? Um, this won't work, right? For example, that's a common thing. Um, why do we even bother? This is not gonna work. This hasn't worked before, right? We tried this two years ago or something and this hasn't worked. Uh, doesn't suit to our team, personality, culture, or company. It doesn't work for us because of these reasons. Or things are fine the way they are. Why change? Status quo. Too disruptive. This is just too much of a big deal. Uh, let's let's not worry too much about this, and and so you know let's just avoid this situation. Let's not change. What if the, the team fails? Right? You have a team, and you've been tasked with doing it. What happens if the team fails? What happens if the project doesn't make it on time? Who's going to take responsibility? So that's another fear factor that that comes into play. Let someone else do this first. Right? We'll follow if it works for them. So that way you're kind of passing the buck and say, let's not worry about it. Let somebody else do the stuff. And, and we will see what happens. You know, we'll live vicariously through them, right, through this process. We will support them, we'll be a backup for them. If it succeeds, fantastic. If it doesn't, well, we didn't lose anything, right? So these, these biases, these resistance um, items that we just talked about, these are actually real. They are very real. Uh, can somebody in the show have hands tell me um, if you've encountered this before? Anybody, right, practically? 60%, I would say 60, 65%. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. These are all, you know, I'm, that's, a very, that's why it says uh, it's a very strong, small list. But biases are real. They are absolutely real. Um, and, and that is something we just have to live with, right? Can't do much about it but we have to work around it somehow or find a way to, to, to reduce the impact, or mitigate that risk of bias affecting your, your transformation. That is absolutely critical. 
So, but before we go further, let's look at motivation. You'll understand why we are looking at it um, when we look at it uh, in, a few, in a few slides from now. So, there are two types of motivations, intrinsic and extrinsic. When you look at studying for an exam, right, uh, you want a result, a certain result. You worked for your boss, and, and your boss is saying, well, you've done this much, here's your reward for that. Because there's going to be a reward, because there's going to be some money at the end of it, because there's going to be some stock option at the end of it or whatever, you're working for it. That's extrinsic motivation. Motivation for something tangible, real, that is not going to be something that's driven by you internally. That's extrinsic motivation. What is intrinsic? Play football for fun, play cricket for fun. It's the season of cricket, so let's play cricket for fun. Why would you play cricket? You know, you're not a, you're not such a right? <laughs> you're, you're not a, you're not a champion. Maybe you are, I don't know. Um, but you play for fun. You play just for the sake of playing, right? It's the whole point, just play for the sake of playing. There's no other reward other than a feeling of happiness or satisfaction or joy or being with your team, being with these people that you consider your friends and colleagues. That's why a lot of companies have, the company I work for, IHS in Bangalore, has a cricket team. So after you know work, they go down and they have a game of cricket every now and then. Why would they do that if there's no reward at the end of it? In fact, it's more hassle, isn't it? You take all your stems and weekend and you go down and, and you put all those things down, play in the heat. What, what joy do you get out of that huge hassle of driving in Bangalore traffic to get to where you're getting and playing? You get internal satisfaction. You get the kind of happiness that cannot be matched by anything else. There's no reward except the process itself, right? In this situation, the journey is the destination, as I like to say. So playing for fun's sake, you know, it's, it's its own reward. Playing for the sake of playing is its own reward. That's why people do that. Now, we're going to talk about some scenarios here. Um, and we will, go, we, we will try to understand some of these scenarios. And there's a template I'm following those scenarios to make it useful for after I'm done with the session. You can take it you know, with you. Um, there's a slide share. It's on slide share if you can find it or you can talk to me after the presentation. I can, I can uh, work with you and get you those slides. Um, these are some of the common categories of concerns, cultures, or, or you know, uh, worries and doubts from generally people that are in the process of adopting Agile. Categories may be valid or they may be exaggerated. Sometimes they're valid. For example, somebody may say, our culture doesn't really uh, support this or that, right? So sometimes they're valid, and I agree. Sometimes they may be exaggerated because you just want to avoid this whole situation to begin with. Um, some of them may be emotional. Uh, for example, hey, I'm working in this team, right? You're talking about this transformation stuff. You're going to take me away from this team because I have the kind of skills that you need there, and so I'm separated from my colleagues. That's an emotional statement. Sometimes it's purely technical. For example, you may say, the kind of work we do, the kind of projects we handle, the kind of technologies we, ha we handle may not be suitable for Scrum or for Agile. Waterfall is best for it. That's an argument you can make in certain regions. Cultural, individual, sometimes it's a cultural thing. For example, we, you, know, you could say, Asian cultures tend to be formed around groups. Western cultures tend to form around individuals. Western cultures are usually very individualistic, and Asian cultures tend to be very group-oriented. So sometimes that can be a factor too, right? And sometimes it's an individual factor. I may not be the kind of person that likes to work with a team, right? I may be a lone wolf. I like to do my own thing. I've been doing my own thing for so long. Now you're asking me to work as part of a team. That's nonsense. I don't want to do that, right? So these kinds of things come up as well, OK? Um, sometimes it's behavioral adjustment. Sometimes people may just get angry and exhibit some symptoms which are not so pleasant. They may, they use swear words. They may cuss. They may get angry, whatever. Um, so you want to be careful about that. And some, sometimes it may require some kind of education. Sometimes there are unfounded concerns you know, about, about, about what you're trying to do. Um, they may not have any validity, but, but they are unfounded. So you want to be careful about that. Sometimes there are concerns about task estimates and accuracy. Sometimes what happens is uh, teams may con make a concern that they may be penalized for wrong estimates. Um, and estimates are not supposed to be accurate to begin with. But people take it that when you estimate something, you're going to do it. You will do it in that time because you estimate. You told me you will do it in five days. It's the sixth day. It's not happened. What's wrong? So these kinds of implications can actually affect how projects work. We talked about agile transformation. We talked about how it touches teams. What we didn't talk about is how it affects other parts of the organization. Agile transformation touches a lot of things. It affects finance, your HR. Uh, it affects um, sales. Affects you know, your, your marketing team. How does it affect HR, for example? Now, show of hands, how many of you have goals that are set on the basis of individual results? How many of you have goals in your company uh, as part of an annual thing where it says individual results? For example, uh, you've been a good developer. 
uh, you've been a you know, good QA, you opened so many test cases, you created so many defects, whatever. I mean, so how many of you work for companies where your goals are set by group objectives, team objectives? Okay, this is very encouraging. <laughs> this is great. So Agile touches that. For companies that are rooted in individual contributions, that's important too, I'm not going to de-emphasize that, but I'm saying for companies that are rooted in the kind of attitude where the individual comes first, we'll have problems. But where you're changing the way your HR system is working and they're saying, let's look at the company point of view. What's good for the group? What's good for the company? Let's make it a group objective. Let's make it a team objective. That's a better strategy when you deal with this. How does it affect your, your, your uh, um, sales or marketing team? When you go agile, you're trying to deliver frequently. Your sales team is probably used to telling your customers, oh, this will take one year. Don't worry about it. Just hang on. But now with Agile, you might be delivering faster. So the conversations that your sales team is having with your customers can change, will change dramatically, actually. So there are some promises they may make, and you ought to be careful about managing those promises because they will think, now that you're Agile, I'm going to get something every two weeks or every three weeks, whatever your sprint uh, iteration is, uh, length is. So we should be careful about those, those kind of conversations also. It can also affect different other aspects that you never even thought of, even maybe even legal, for example, who knows. So Agile transformation will affect a lot of different areas of your team. Some of them, you, what, do you, what do you expect? Some of them may be completely unexpected. Some of them are un, unintended consequences of, of doing this kind of transformation. So you should be careful. You should weigh your transformation carefully. You should see where all, what are the areas it's touching, how it's touching it, what are the implications of those kinds of things, okay? So um, this, this is also a valid concern about workday hours. For example, you may say, well, every two weeks I'm supposed to do something, right? If I'm supposed to do every, something every two weeks, I'm under a lot of pressure. I'm supposed to deliver this unit of code every two weeks. That's, that's difficult for me to do. So that can raise concerns about, about work hours. How many hours am I supposed to work to do this? That raises the concerns about estimates. If I promise something, am I going to be held responsible for it? Okay. So these are different scenarios that, that can happen when you're, when you're handling this. And of course, you're talking about being fearful of change. There are two things that most people are, are concerned about. The first one is change. Change is always, not always, but I would say most of the time, stressful. It causes something to get modified in your belief system or your internal system that kind of maybe violates it to some extent. And you don't like that. You don't want that change to affect you. And so change can be, and usually is, stressful. And so you're fearful of anything that is stressful. So the underlying emotion under all of these is fear. Resistance, bias, doesn't matter what you call it. The underlying emotion at the root of all is fear. Therefore, the first and most important thing that a manager can do, the most useful and effective thing a manager can do is remove that fear. Create an environment where people are fearless. People are not afraid to speak their mind. People are not afraid to say, there is a problem. Raise their hand and say, there's an issue here. How many of you um, work for organizations where it is encouraged to be a dissenter? Encouraged to be somebody who talks against what is the, whatever the conversation is going on. Is it encouraged? A few, few hands. In the, in the Israeli army, uh, there is always this, this um, trend where if five people are saying something, the sixth man is obligated to argue against it. He's obligated. He can't agree. So the reason why he's obligated is, however crazy his justifications may seem, the dissent is important. Dissent is critical. Dissent is not treason. Dissent is not... Um, Lack of patriotism. Dissent is not something that is being stubborn or resistant. Dissent, in a healthy way, is extremely healthy. It is what makes you question what you're doing and answer questions that have not been raised so far. If you don't have dissent, you have a bunch of yes. Do you really want to go along a path where five people are telling you, this is all great, this is full of you know, land of milk and honey and sunshine, and you find out two weeks from the, that point that it's really not what it was supposed to be, right? So there are huge implications for when people don't dissent, but everybody becomes, you know, yes men, or there's a group think, as I mentioned earlier. So, um, to show of hands again, how many of you believe dissent is important? Oh, that's amazing! It's almost every single person here. <laughs> so you believe that it is true. Are you doing something in your organization to say that value this? Okay. Of course, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Uh, <laughs> on principle, you have to disagree. I totally agree with that. <laughs> uh, 
that, that is how you get your way, right? <laughs> that is how you, you win, win uh, influence. Um, so without dissent, you're going to have a problem. You know, I'm, I'm not saying find somebody who's going to fight for the sake of fighting or say some nonsensical words for the saying of, sake of saying nonsensical words. But you must have that one person, at least one person who says, let me think, rethink this. Let me, let me think about this. There's something off about it. Let me go research and come back. You have to have that one opinion which stands out. If you don't, you are just at very high risk of failing. Now, we come to kind of the core of this. Now, I'm not going to be um, talking about each of these slides, right, because that is, that is um, difficult to do. Uh, there's too many of them. But we are going to talk about some cultural roadblocks and behavioral challenges um, in some of these areas that you, that you will face. So first is ownership. Let me do a quick check on my, on my time. Okay. So first is ownership, right? In, under ownership, there is sometimes a narrow issue, a uh, narrow view of ownership. Um, for example, somebody may be concerned about what's directly laid on the team's plate and nothing else. Nothing, nothing else matters, right? So this is not my problem or my team's problem is one such example. Okay. How do you deal with these? How do you deal with this strategy? Uh, how, what strategy do you use to deal with this problem? Uh, you can emphasize transcending the job description and, and, and you can say, well, a given problem is everybody's to, to solve. It's not just your problem. This is a business problem. We are all obligated to, to solve this issue. Or you can emphasize going above and beyond the call of duty and so how many of you have companies where it is encouraged to break down silos and virtual walls that you build around yourselves? Okay, that's 50-50, I guess. <laughs> so that can cause problems, right? When you have these walls dividing you, that can cause a lot of problems. Um, talk about how the business can succeed when they support each other and, and don't create islands. Because it's very easy to create islands, very easy to create silos. It's not going to be really helpful uh, when you do that. So in this fashion, we have, you know, I have a whole bunch of slides that talk about uh, you know, what, what, what these issues are and, and how we can resolve them. So there's something called belonging. I'm going to just go through quickly, but I'm going to show you what they are. Uh, there's something called belonging. There's status quo. Now, each of these slides, if you look at the template that I followed, first of all, I describe the issue, right, what the issue is, and a general statement or a brief description of what that issue might be, and or as an example. And then there are some strategies that you can use to deal with these kind of issues. Now, culturally, as I mentioned to you, certain cultures are, are inclined not to disagree, inclined not to say no. Uh, they just find it hard to say no. In certain cultures, it is very easy to say no. Uh, if you look at the culture of India in general, or Asian cultures in general, um, there, is, there are two, two things at play. Uh, one is consideration, one is fear. Uh, fear is universal, right? Everybody has that in them. Now, consideration is something different. Uh, I was giving this example a couple of days ago where you talk to a, Let's say your, your, your director calls you from some other country and expects you to give a status update. And, and you're telling them, well, there's something wrong with it. Uh, there is something wrong with something. And you're not able to tell, your, tell that person that because number one, it's the element of fear. What will they think? Number two, it's the consideration that if I tell this person something's wrong, um, they'll get stressed or upset or worried about it. And so that's the consideration aspect, which is kind of unique to Asian cultures. So saying no or expressing there's a problem is, is very difficult in certain cultures. Um, there's also things like leadership. You know, what, kind of, what can we do to encourage leadership? What can we do to make sure people take up these, these ideas and they run with it? Uh, you have to create this kind of environment where there's no fear, in, uh, where people are encouraged to experiment, and people are encouraged to, to make mistakes if, if, if they, they, they have to, to, to get it going. Okay. So we look at execution and commitment. Very narrow idea of execution and commitment is a very common theme. Uh, so how many of you have dealt with situations where you were told uh, this is a problem, but then a response from the team came back that this is outside the scope of responsibility and duties? How many of you have faced this situation? That's, that's, that's a pretty decent number, right? So I would say about 40%. Uh, so what, what does that mean? Why, why? And for example, this is somebody else's headache, <laughs> not mine. Why should I deal with it? I have to go home, it's 5 p.m., right? But what can you do about it? Uh, you can educate the team about the growth that is possible. You can elaborate how uh, the organization grows by contributions, and you can talk about horizontally, grow horizontally. Uh, how many of you have companies which have an enterprise social network implemented uh, in your organization? That's pretty good. So is, is Jive the main platform you're using, or Chatter, or Yammer, or something? OK, Yammer, OK. So mostly Microsoft types, of, right? OK. So um, that's important. Use that tool. Leverage that tool to, to spread it. That's very critical. You have to use that to build networks and break the horizontal uh, Grow horizontally, break the vertical walls down. Oh, thank you. So, so he, it's in action right now. He, my colleague just posted a picture of me on the, on our internal social network. <laughs> so anyway, 
Um, so responsibility, this is about my pay grade, this is my, not my decision, this is my lead's decision, right? So what, how do you deal with that? Tell your members it's okay to you know, stop the train if you have to, okay? Um, interruptions are okay, hold your, hold your horses. If sometimes you may need to hold your horses. Uh, demonstrate a commitment. And the most important thing is they learn something is valuable only when they can question something and take charge of the situation. If you cannot question something, like I said about dissent, if you cannot question something, question the purpose of something, you're not learning. You're simply following orders. What is so great about following orders? Anybody can follow orders. You know, horses and elephants and monkeys can follow orders. Why should we just blindly follow orders? Question them, not with the sake of being argumentative or for the sake of being uh, a pain, but question because you want to learn. You want to genuinely know why. And we'll come to one of the most important things. Um, There's, of course, the communication issue, which is extremely valuable and critical, and people ignore these things. Agile transformation, where companies focus on tools, methodologies, processes, ignore the human element, this is one area where the team never grows, is communication. How many of you have faced unintended consequences of bad communication? Like an email that was misrepresented or some communique from the head of the department. Okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> so this, this is valid. <laughs> so this happens. So you have to deal with these in that, in that, in that fashion. There's perceived helplessness. Okay, you know, you know, I can do it, but I don't want to do it because I can't do it. There's some other problem that stops me from doing it. Um, you know, not wanting to step on others' toes. You're sensitive about something. Oh, I'm helpless. Nobody's helpless. Your helplessness stems from your desire not to offend, desire not to step on others' toes, or desire not to take the initiative. That's what is the problem. So how do you deal with that, right? You can pull together and tell stories of people being recognized and promoted for, for doing this, for taking this approach, and show them you value their ability to be altruistic. Show them that they do something that goes beyond their pale of whatever they're supposed to do. You'll be rewarded for that. And like I said, banish the idea of recommendations for helping others. That, that's very important. Uh, you have to stand with your team. Rocking the boat is another problem, right? You have this issue where uh, you don't want to rock the boat. You don't want to say no. There are all sorts of problems going on, and, and you never know. Uh, how many of you have faced a situation where there was something very wrong, but you didn't know till the last minute of deployment or your production stage? How many of you have faced this problem where uh, it was just hidden, almost hidden to the last minute? Uh, I know my colleagues have had this issue, and some others are raising their hands. And this happens quite a bit, where people don't want to say no, or they don't want to express their problem because it can paint them in the wrong color. They, they're afraid of that. So these are some strategies you can use to help your team say it's OK to rock the boat. It's OK to say there is a problem. OK to say no. That's perfectly all right, in, in, especially in the Indian culture. You know, being from the same culture, I can tell you, I have a hard time saying no sometimes. I have sometimes I work, I've had to work weekends and late nights because I didn't tell my boss it was OK to say no. I, I didn't feel like it was OK to say no. And I got extra work on top of it. <laughs> so I've since learned to say that. Um, but infrastructure issues are very common too. Now, why am I bringing up all of these topics here? Why, what are these categories that I'm making? They're, they fall in three categories. First, things I've experienced myself firsthand, personally. Second is what I've observed, not experienced, but observed other teams and other colleagues have this problem. And the third category are stories from people that, that have told me that this has happened. Okay, So denial. Uh, this is, an again, a very common problem. You, you're going to have denial as, as a, one of your base problems to some extent. Um, so, it, so this is the why's, but people don't question. People don't want to know why we are doing something. If you don't question why, then you're not learning anything. So lack of transparency, right? So these are issues that are actually real. I mean, this is a very small list of things that I've gathered over time, but you will see this is a very small list. You personally are probably dealing with issues that are way more complex than this, and way more in number. You just, you know, just don't see it here because it's something that I have not picked up on, maybe. And but these are real. These are issues that are actually happening. What can we do about these? Well, these are cultural issues. Some of these transcend cultures. Absolutely true. Some of them are across all cultures, no matter where they are. Some of them are very specific to a certain culture. I think people here can recognize which of these are specific to their own culture. I think that should be clear by now. Nobody told me to do something. Well, nobody told me to unit test. Nobody, because it's something that people think they are owed. Somebody has to tell them what to do, hold them by the hand and walk them, right? So if they don't do that, then they can't do it. So these are some strategies you can use for each of these situations to deal with. Now, what are some recommendations? I have some recommendations. Uh, remember, this, call, this talk is about cultures, how cultures affect. 
each of the things I have listed, like I said, are true across cultures. Some of them are very specific to some cultures. And what are some recommendations? How can you work around some of these? Okay. First of all, work, conduct workshops. Try to conduct workshops and conversations, have meetings about cultures and principles and sensitivities around dealing with other cultures. You have to have this conversation. If you don't do that, if you think, for example, you're only managers need this, only directors need this, only VPs need this. They are the ones who are dealing with uh, customers from other countries. Your developers don't need this. But you're, you forget, if you're part of a global organization like in IHS is, I deal with, for example, you know, people in Ukraine, uh, my previous job, I dealt with people in Ukraine. Now I deal with you know, Gdansk, uh, some in the UK, um, you know, for India itself, and so many other countries. I have to be sensitive to each of these countries, where they come from. When they say something, what do they mean? I have to be very careful about that. Leadership should encourage more meaningful exchanges across teams and global locations. If leadership is not doing that, okay, then there's a failure, a problem. There's a big problem, and, and this is going to affect you. I talked about ESN, Enterprise Social Network. Please, if you don't have it, please use it. Please look at using it across the organization. This is very important. This can easily help you uh, get that cross-domain knowledge going, help your colleagues across different countries connect together and collaborate. And leadership understand, you know, if leadership doesn't understand that all cultures may not value the same things. For example, in Germany, you can't contact somebody after 5 p.m., right? It's the Blackberry won't show it. The, the email would shut down automatically. Uh, people value, you know, vacation in France, in Europe generally. In some countries, not so much. In the U.S., U.S. is probably the worst of all in taking vacation time. They just don't. They're always working, right? So these are some real problems, and we should tell people that these are issues you should be aware of when you work with people in different cultures. If you don't, you're doing a great disservice to your organization. And spread news widely about any successful things that you've done. If something has worked for you in the past, something has gone well, please spread the news. Talk about it. If you don't talk about it, they will never know about it. You know, and if you don't discuss these things openly and widely, how will anybody know what's going on, right? This is, these are the roots of your success. You have to take this seriously. And finally, identify local champions and leaders. You may have some local champions and leaders who are willing to do these things for you. Identify them. See who's willing to take up, you know, take up the gauntlet and say, well, I will take care of it. I'll lead a session. I will I'll work across silos. I will deal with these people. And I can help train the rest of my team in how to deal with different cultures. If you don't have these things going on, uh, at least one or two of these things going on, um, either you're not a global company, or you're a global company, but you don't really care about working across cultures and understanding how cultures work. Okay. So that is the pretty much the end of my, my presentation. Um, questions? A big part of that actually depends on the manager, how he reacts. Mm hearing a problem. If the team talks about a problem and the manager's reaction is not that great, yeah. the team will not talk about the problem next time. Yes. So why we can teach the team or train the team about mm. culture changes, what is your culture, yeah. um, it's more important to have the day-to-day -day interaction managed by the leadership in the proper manner. Yeah. Yes, I have seen that a big challenge Absolutely. In, in several organizations. Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons I was talking about leadership being important, right? So leaders should be encouraging. If, if the manager, if the question generally was, if the manager is not going to be positively, um, you know, favorably oriented towards these kind of conversations, open conversations, the whole thing will fail. That's true. That's exactly the problem I'm talking about. If your leadership at the highest level, from CEO on down, doesn't say this is important, nobody's going to pay attention to these things. Some of these things have to be mandated. So yes, if you want to encourage a fearless environment, your managers have to be open to that. He has to be trained to understand that this is critical. He, you know. The, the command and control structure that Sean was talking about earlier, that's very true, it happens where people just get focused on every single you know, minutiae, small details, and somebody questions something, they get panicky. Oh, does this affect my, my effectiveness? Is somebody questioning my competence, right? So yeah, th there should be a, an element of fearlessness everywhere. That's the culture we want to drive towards is to have the team question whatever they want to question, and the manager should not be the person to determine that at all. But thank you, good question. Any, anybody else? Any? Yes, that's the whole point. Manager creates a safe environment. If he doesn't do that, then the teams can't, you know, raise the, get the full benefit of the situation. Yeah. Uh, what I want to understand was the whole barriers which you observed. Which was the most difficult one for you in your organization, mm -hmm. and how did you circumvent it? Well, easy. Okay. Communication. <laughs> that is the biggest challenge. 
the, the same word can mean different things in different ways. Um, as an example, I can say he's cultured. That means one thing. Uh, I can say your organization has a culture. That's different. I can say India has a separate type of culture. That's a different thing. The same word means different things. A um, lot of people that I observed did not understand the import on the context of the information being presented. Email is probably the worst way invented to communicate. The worst. It's not, you know, one of the worst. So avoid email by all means. But that personally what I've encountered is communication has been the number one enemy. Now the lack of communication or bad communication has been the number one enemy for effectiveness in terms of getting deep collaboration and connection going. Um, any other questions? So one question. So you spoke yeah. about uh, the shared goals, that is team goals versus individual goals. Yeah. So when it comes to quality of uh, the product that's being delivered, so should we not measure the individuals instead mm -hmm. of measuring as a team? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Like I said, um, you can do both. Point is to do just one exclusively could be a problem, right? So if you just measure individuals, you're going to get individual results, right? So if I just measure lines of code, people are going to put 10,000 comments. Okay, if you just measure defects, people are going to open crazy defects, defects which make no sense. So that's individual measurement can be risky. Group measurement, you're making the team accountable for something. Yes, absolutely. But you also have to recognize leaders in your team. Some of them may be um, aspiring leaders. So generate measures for them. Find out how they can collaborate. Um, change the job description. At IHS, currently, we are in the middle of re-evaluating our job descriptions. We are changing our job, job descriptions to better match agility, better match collaboration, better matching customer engagement. We are changing job descriptions as we speak. So that's something we've recognized and what you just brought out. So thank you, good question. A anybody else? Any, any other questions? Yeah. Sure. Testing in is used to log a lot of defects. Yeah. QA manager, uh, end of the year during appraisal, he tries to identify how many, how these guys are logging the bugs, and based on that performance here, they're going to recognize. Okay. Now, in agile world here, uh, we should not, QA guy should not worry about how many bugs he's logging. Okay, so he has to uh, help the developer to uh, fix the bugs quickly. Mm -hmm. So he may not go to the bugs to log the defects, he will not waste the time. So he just has to sit with the developer or just uh, uh, send a bug with the mail or put it in Excel yeah. and so that here we can quicken the process. Yeah. But this is making the making difficult for the manager to validate the queue engineer. Here queue engineer is worried that he's not getting proper recognition. I understood. I understood. Because metrics are not being uh, I, I understand. displayed. So no. how do we resolve such kind of issues? So this is, the, this is the fundamental problem I talked about when you measure things such as number of defects. Metrics are dangerous. Number That's rule number one. Metrics are dangerous. You got to be careful what kind of metrics you're measuring. You know, like say you manage what you measure, you measure what you manage. Be careful about metrics because if you measure things like, I just mentioned lines of code, number of defects, you're going to have a problem uh, because people are being incentivized for the wrong things, right? You're looking at number of defects, not the quality. Again, if you look at the team as a whole, what should you really look at? The attitude needs to change. The, the only question you have to ask is this. Did we deliver value to our customers? If you did, the team succeeded. Nothing else matters. These defects and other things, they don't matter. They're important, but to measure them exclusively as a, as an index of performance of a QA is extremely misguided. And th that's some of the things that are going on in our own organization, I can tell you. This is not a new problem. Uh, how many of you have had metrics that measure the wrong thing? Uh, that's, that's a decent number, right? We, we understand these issues happen because we measure the wrong thing. Why do we measure the wrong thing? Because it is easy to measure the wrong thing. These things are available easily. You go into your TFS, your report in two seconds, you can get a report on how many defects were opened by how many people, right? Because this, in, this information is accessible, people go for that. That's what causes the problem. Does, does that help? In fact, here, uh, you, uh, you explained this problem from the management point of view. Mm -hmm. And speaking like a testing engineer. Mm -hmm. So actually here, testing engineer, he's identifying good bugs. Yeah. Okay, he's doing very good job. It is easy to identify difference between a good testing engineer and bad testing engineer. Yes. Good testing engineer identifies good bugs at the right time. Yes. With the right quality. Absolutely. But the thing is, management doesn't know that he's doing good job. Yeah. In agile world. Yeah. No, that, that's not entirely true. Um, the manager, if he's not involved with the team, will not know that. If the manager is involved with the team, uh, attends a daily stand up or something, or talks to people on a daily basis, see, the root is communication again. If the communication is not happening with these people, he will never know. So he can't sit behind his computer and keep looking for how many defects are being opened on a daily basis. If he's doing that, he's not doing a job. I can hire an accountant for one tenth of his salary to do the same job. Why is he a manager for? 
He's a manager to mentor and grow his team. If he's not doing that, he should really be fired, in my opinion. Well, still my question is not answered. Because manager doesn't have a role in ideal scrum team. Yeah. So always here there is a lot of communication gap uh, between uh, people manager and the uh, team. Understood. And, and that, is, that is grounds for training. That is really grounds for coaching. Coaching is the, is the key there. The, the manager needs to understand what is important. If he's not going to be coached properly, he's going to measure the wrong thing. I think we are going to be out of time in about two Sorry minutes. I think there's something else happening. Is there a, what is the next session? 2.30, right? OK, sorry, I got But you had a question? I, I can answer you offline, sorry. Yeah, I can take your question offline. No, I was just sending you the answer. OK, OK, but you can talk to him then. Yeah, All right, just give me a while. All right uh, I'll wrap up then. I'll wrap up then, sorry. OK, thank you very much, and uh, great, uh, great session. Thanks for feedback. Thank you.